There are several problems facing the global economy. I think it's fairly clear that there is going to be a growth slowdown, uh, that the economy uh, was given what is now generally called a sugar high by the combination of the tax reform bill in, in December of 2017 and then the expenditure increases in January 2018, creating a very large increase in the deficit when the deficit was already very large and that provided some short-term stimulus to the economy. It was not well designed and the money didn't go into long-term investment, it went into share buybacks. The result of all that is it didn't provide the foundations of sustainable growth. There are several problems uh, facing the global economy. Europe remains very weak. Part of the reason has to do with some fundamental flaws in the Euro, there are political problems. Italy has not had growth and the Euro doesn't have a, give it a framework within which to restore growth. Uh, so you're really having near stagnation in Europe. Meanwhile, China is also having problems. What I describe what's going on is that they alternate putting their foot on the accelerator and then on the brake because the only way they goose their economy is through debt. I don't see uh, the basis of stable growth in China. The third obvious concern is Trump's protectionism. And we're talking about China, we're talking about a trade war with Europe over automobiles, we're talking about sort of the global rules-based system which he has systematically attacked. The WTO this year uh, will wind up uh, without having an effective appellate body because the United States refuses to allow new judges to be elected. So the WTO, which was the basis of the rules-based global system, is, is going to be facing difficulties. So all of these are significant headwinds confronting the global economy, and we're part of the global economy, and so uh, we will feel some of the bumps that we ourselves have created. Many of us who were critics of the WTO, and I think correctly, didn't really appreciate the virtues of the WTO until we actually confronted the reality of a world without rules. You can't imagine how any economy, American economy, could operate without the rule of law. It's sort of the foundation of our economy, of our society. We talk about the rule of law all the time. And the same thing actually applies internationally. You need a rule of law. It's a much more bare-bone rule of law. And that's what the WTO provided. Some of the rules were not well designed. They were rules that were written by the advanced countries for their corporate interests. And that's really been my complaint, that to too large an extent, the rules were dictated by American and European corporations. For instance, access to drugs. They made it more difficult to get access to life-saving drugs, drove the prices of drugs up. And it seemed so unfair that we had an international regime which allowed the advanced countries to subsidize their agricultural goods like cotton. Billions of dollars going to a few thousand, maybe 25,000 rich American cotton farmers, putting deeper into poverty tens of millions of people in Africa and India. And to me, I found that abhorrent. And uh, so that's what I would criticize. Manufacturing is not gonna come back to the United States, we're not gonna recreate the golden era of capitalism, the 1950s or 60s. Even if China didn't export as much manufacturers goods to us, we're not gonna make most of the apparel in the United States. We're gonna be importing it from Vietnam or Bangladesh. And to the extent that manufacturing goes back to the United States with a process which is called onshoring, it's gonna be robots. It's not going to be jobs in the Midwest, there's jobs in South Carolina. 
So in the end, for all the rhetoric, Trump is not delivering. Manufacturing jobs have come back a little bit. As our economy uh, recovers from that long uh, and great recession, some of those jobs are coming back, and I think there's more that we can do to bring them back. But the basis of that is going to be research. It's going to be strengthening our universities. But these are the things that Trump is trying to undermine. He's trying to defund research, defund the policies that actually bring those jobs back in a sustainable way and make sure that the industrial jobs that are brought back are really good jobs. What Trump did was to recognize that we had not managed the process of structural transformation of our economy. We were going from a manufacturing economy into a service economy, into an innovation economy. And that process of deindustrialization associated both with globalization and with technological change is a difficult process. And we left a lot of people without help to move into the new economy. You see it in so many dimensions. We didn't give them the education that they needed, but Trump University is not the kind of education they need. They need real education, and we've been cutting back on the kinds of real education they need. So while he grasped, you might say, the, the despair, he grasped the concerns, he's a populist in the sense there are no real solutions that he's offered, and it actually made things worse. I'm not a big UBI person. I understand that there are some advantages of providing a single program, guaranteeing a, a basic income to everybody. But to me, the basic responsibility of our society, of our government, is to make sure that there's a job for everybody who's able and willing to work. And if we had a job with decent pay for everybody able and willing to work, then the concerns about UBI wouldn't be there. We will still need, of course, to have social protection systems for the disabled, for you know, a whole set of people who can't work. But that should be the core of a program that provides a, a system of social protection for our society. It's especially important for two reasons. I think, and I may be a little old-fashioned on this, I think there's a certain dignity from work. Younger students say, oh, there can be a lot of dignity from meditation and from other ways of spending time. But I think for most people, there will be a, a real desire to work. And this will be a big challenge going forward. We don't know exactly when driverless cars and trucks are going to arrive. We know that even high-tech jobs like radiologists are not immune. Computerized radiology is, is actually better than most uh, humans. So there's a lot of areas where machines in one way or another will be not only stronger, can do data processing faster, but actually can learn in certain limited domains uh, and even be creative in certain ways. So this is going to be one of the big challenges of the next quarter century. I titled my book, People, Power, and Profits. It was trying to say the only balance is going to be mass movements, people engaged in politics, because in the end, the way our economy and the way our society functions is determined by rules that are set publicly. There is a real concern that the problems of inequality that I've uh, been so concerned with for so long will be getting worse and part of the reason is uh, the problems of unemployment that it can give rise to but also part of it is the ability of AI and the new technologies to be more efficient in exploitation. They can target prices at exactly what each person pays it actually undermines the basis of a, the market economy as we've known it in the past, a price system where in your standard courses in economics, it's about how prices make sure that the marginal benefit of a good is the same for all individuals, the marginal cost is the same in all uses of production. Uh, but with the new technologies, everybody's paying a different price, uh, every firm is paying a different price, and it actually undermines the efficiency of the market economy, and it takes 
we call, economists call producer surplus, surplus from individuals and adds it to the profits of some of the wealthiest people uh, in the country. Over the last 40 years, corporate power, profits, have been driving the rules. We've become a more corrupt politics, a more money-driven politics, and we've lost the balance in our politics. Not surprising, given that we've lost the balance in our politics, we've lost the balance in our economics. There's been an erosion, an evisceration of worker power over the last 50 years. We have to get the rules of globalization right. They've contributed to the weakening of worker uh, bargaining power. We have problems in our corporate governance where CEOs are taking a larger and larger share of the corporate pie, advancing themselves at the expense of the workers and of investment. And that's one of the reasons why our investment rate is so low and our overall growth rate is so low. Now, when it comes to the particular problem of innovation, I think we have to realize that the core of our innovation system is government-funded basic research and government-funded education programs. And uh, those are absolutely essential for making a dynamic economy. The irony is that while the basis of all the innovation in our economy is government-funded, too little of the proceeds go back to the public. So there has to be a better sharing of the proceeds of the innovation. And that may be done through taxation, it may be done through adjustment of our intellectual property regime. There are many ways to do it. It may turn out to, to vary across industry and you know over time. Uh, but what is very clear is there has to be a better system of sharing uh, of these proceeds. I've been a great advocate of moving to an electronic payments mechanism. There are a lot uh, of efficiencies. I think we can actually have a better regulated economy. If we had all the data in real time, knowing what people are spending, uh, it would enable the Federal Reserve to actually set interest rates in a much more efficient way, we would have, I think, better macroeconomic management. It also would curb some of the illicit economic activities, and it disturbed me a great deal the attention that was given to cryptocurrencies, because those were moving things off of a transparent platform into a dark platform. We know about the role of real estate and money laundering. Uh, we know from the Paradise Papers and the Panama Papers the extent of this money laundering. We know from research in recent years, for instance, the work of Gabriel Zuckman, uh, the large percentage of global wealth that is held in these dark havens. So if we want a more efficient economy without these illicit activities, I think we're going to have to move to more of an electronic payments mechanism and we will have to figure a way out to have the transparency of an electronic payments mechanism without the dangers of the surveillance and the surveillance state. We have a very good currency. So far, the currency has been run in a very stable way. There is no need for anybody to go to a cryptocurrency. You know, in our standard courses in economics, we talk about the attributes of a good currency, and the US dollar has all those attributes. The cryptocurrencies do not have those attributes. Um, I actually think we should shut down the cryptocurrencies.